everyone and welcome back to my channel true crime and felines halloween for those that are new here my name is brandy and every friday i bring you a true crime case or mystery with one or more of my fabulous felines unfortunately i am not in my regular filming spot there is a lot going on in my household right now so i have to film from here but also, I wanted to celebrate Halloween by giving you all this month stories of true crime stories or mysteries that happened on Halloween. So I thought this background was a little bit more appropriate as well. If a cat walks by, I swear to God, I'll grab them and hold them up to the camera. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll have to enjoy myself as a cat. For my returning subscribers, welcome back my feline friends and a big shout out to my feline fans who are members of this channel. This week's case is about a Halloween shooting that the eventual motive that came out about it shocks everyone, especially in the 1950s. So let's get started. So this story starts around a man named Peter Fabiano. Now, Peter was a 35-year-old man living in Los Angeles, California when this happened. But let's go into a little bit of history. Now, Peter in the 1940s actually was a truck driver. So he went from a truck driver to a hairstylist. So you're never too old to start over. Now, while he was living in New York as a truck driver, he met a woman named Betty. Now, Betty had been married once before, but had divorced, and she was now a single mother of two. The two hit it off, and they ended up getting married in New York. And they lived there for many years, until 1956, they decided to move to Los Angeles, California, and they opened two beauty shops a hair salon, and a beauty parlor. And they were actually very successful in these business ventures. So they lived pretty comfortably. So it's Halloween night, 1957. And Peter had been passing out candy all night to the neighborhood children coming to his door. However, it was getting late and all the children started going home. So Peter and Betty decided to call it a night and get ready for bed. It was about 11 p.m. when Peter heard a knock at the door. Now, Peter did think it was a little late for the children to be out trick-or-treating still, but he grabbed the bowl of candy anyway and opened the door. Betty, who was still in bed, had heard Peter open the door and state, a little late for this, isn't it? And then she said she heard some voices and then a loud pop. Betty got out of bed and ran to the door to find her husband laying in a pool of blood in the doorway. She realized that the loud pop she heard was a gunshot. Now, where Betty and Peter lived, they actually lived right next door to a policeman. So Betty ran over next door, aroused the policeman out of bed. So he called the police and the ambulance and Peter was taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, Peter was pronounced dead at the hospital from his injuries. He had been shot right through the chest. So police searched the crime scene. Hey, we have a kitty. Say hello, Freddy. Say hello, I come to visit. I'm wondering what mommy's doing in her office so late. <laughs> okay, so police started searching the crime scene and they found no gunshot shells at all. The only evidence they had was the single bullet that was inside of Peter. They saw that nothing was taken from the house, so theft wasn't a motive, although it was obvious that this family had some pretty expensive things. They searched the neighborhood for a witness, and the only witness they found was a teenager stating that he witnessed a car speeding away down the street and just kind of ignored it, but he couldn't tell what type of car it was or who was in it or anything like that. At first, police stated that this shooting kind of looked like a gang hit. 
you know, because there was no theft or anything like that. He was just shot and whoever and left for dead, right? But they looked into Peter's past and they found no connections to gangs or crime syndicates or anything like that. So that theory was quickly thrown out the window. Now, Betty was pretty distraught over everything and she had to take a bit to calm down. But when she finally calmed down, police questioned her and was like, is there anything you can tell us at all to help us with this? So Betty explained that she believed there were two men at the door as she heard a deep voice, but then the other voice, she said it kind of sounded like a man pretending to be a woman. When Betty was asked if anyone wanted to harm Peter or maybe had a grudge against him, Betty really couldn't think of anybody. Peter was actually pretty loved and respected, and genuinely he was a nice guy. But after some time, Betty did give one name, and that name was Joan Rebel. Betty stated that Joan Rebel was actually a family friend and their relationship went sour, and she didn't really elaborate much more on that. Joan Rebel was born in 1917, and she actually had a very good career as a writer and a photographer. She would sail around the Americas for her job, and apparently this affected her marriage. She was married, but then started going through a divorce. So in 1957, she was recently divorced and apparently needed a job. So she was no longer doing what she was doing before. So she showed up at one of Peter's hair salons asking for a job. And of course, Peter being the nice guy he was, gave her a job. So Joan started working in the hair salon with Peter, um, not sure what she was doing. I know there was some photography in it, so maybe she was styling hair and then taking pictures or marketing or something. Not sure what she was doing, but she did work for Peter. So while she was working, she actually started to become really close with Betty, Peter's wife. Joan and Betty began a friendship and became very close friends and kind of accepted then her as part of the family. At one point, Peter and Betty started having some marriage problems, and Betty would end up moving in with Joan for a while until she reconciled with Peter shortly after that. But that's as far as Betty told the story and just said that they had a falling out with Joan and they no longer spoke. So police went and questioned Joan. Joan stated she knew nothing about Peter's death uh, seemed shocked about it, seemed saddened by it, stated that she no longer worked for Peter and Betty, uh, but again, she knew nothing about the death. So they let her go. Weeks would go by and the case just seemed to hit a dead end. Nobody really seemed to know what happened to Peter or who did this to him. Then they suddenly get a break. There was a call that came into the tip line to the police and they never knew who the caller was. But what the caller had stated was that they needed to go down to this department store and look in one of the rented lockers. So back then, if you went to a department store, you could rent a locker in the back to put your stuff in, I guess, for short or long term. Anyway, they needed to go look at one of these lockers because they believed in the locker there was evidence of what happened to Peter that could help break the case. So they go down to these lockers, search them, and they find a gun. They run ballistics tests on this gun and determine that it matched the bullet that they pulled out of Peter. So this is the gun that shot Peter. They run the serial number and the gun actually belongs to a woman named Goldine Pizer. So who is Goldine? Well, Goldine was born in Illinois and moved to California in the 1940s. Goldine was actually a medical secretary at a lab and had been recently divorced herself, only being married a couple months. See, it was rumored that Goldine liked women. And after her divorce, it was kind of well known in her circle of friends that she dated women. Now, that was really, really taboo in the 1950s, and I believe in the books it was actually illegal at the time. But just because Goldine dated women, and you know, that wasn't quote unquote normal, 
they still couldn't find a connection between Goldine and Peter. Like, if Goldine did this, why? So they tracked down Goldine and brought her in for questioning. Now, Goldine really did not waste any time. <laughs> she started just uh, telling the story right away and confessed that, yes, she shot Peter and that it was actually a relief to get it off her chest, that she was just had been racked with guilt. So the question was, all right, Goldine, what the hell happened? <laughs> so Goldine started off explaining that her friend Joan, Rebel, made her do it. See, Goldie explained that it wasn't that many months ago that Goldine met Joan and they hit it off pretty well and uh, became friends and would get together every morning for coffee. During these morning coffee meetings, Joan would go on and on and on about her former employer, Peter, and how evil and vile man he was. Now, at this time, Joan was no longer you know, working for Peter. So whatever fallout had happened, it obviously had pissed off Joan. Now, Goldine is believing Joan's stories about Peter and felt bad for, you know, her friend and soon found herself hating Peter just as much as Joan did, even though Goldine never met Peter in her whole life. Then Joan, at one point, just threw it out there that Peter must die. And Goldine agreed. So they planned his murder for three months. And Joan even would take Goldine to one of his salons and point him out so Goldine knew what he looked like. So before the murder on October 21st, Goldine went and purchased a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber pistol. But Joan was the one who gave Goldine the money for it. So, as you can see here, Joan is manip manipulating her friend Goldine from the start, unfortunately. So, Goldine states that on the night of the murder, October 31st, 1957, Joan had came over to Goldine's house and she had brought jeans, a khaki jacket, a hat, and a mask and red gloves and a brown paper bag that they used for trick-or-treating that they were going to put the gun in. So they were gonna dress up so Peter would not recognize Joan. Not that he would recognize Goldine at all, but he wouldn't recognize Joan, and then they were going to kill him. Joan even went so far as to borrow her friend's car so her own car would not be implicated in the murder. So the plan was is that both women would go to Peter's house in this borrowed car, dressed up so they wouldn't be recognized, knock on the door like they were trick-or-treaters, and when Peter answered, they'd shoot him. And that's exactly what happened. The two women arrived at Peter's house about 9 p.m. that night, and they just sat in the car and watched the house. Now, when all the lights went out when they were ready for bed, that's when they decided to make their move. So the two women approached Peter's house and knocked on the door. Peter answered, asking, it's a little late for this, isn't it? Where Joan answered, no. And at that point, Goldine held up the gun in the, inside the bag and shot Peter. Then both women fled the scene immediately and sped away in the car. So after the shooting, both women had to go to Joan's friend's house to return the car. And so they returned the car, I'm sure to the, you know, hopefully unexpecting friend that this car was just used in a murder. But they return the car and then at some point they uh, get rid of their evidence by burning their clothes and all that. After that was all done, Joan had turned to Goldine and she said, forget you ever knew me and walked away. Now Goldine was obviously upset by this because this was seemingly her only friend at this point and her friend just dumped her without even a thanks. Now, Goldine realized that after she got home, she still had the gun, that they had got rid of all the evidence but the gun, and she wasn't sure what to do with it, and Joan didn't tell her what to do with it. She needed the gun out of her house, so that's when she hid it at the storage locker at the department store, thinking that nobody would ever find it. Now, who called in there with this tip? It was never said, but it could have been Goldine herself to get it off her chest. 
Now the police had the story of what happened, but then they had a bigger question of, well, what the hell was Joan's beef with Peter? And why the hell did Joan want Peter dead? Well, buckle up, kiddos. So we know that Betty and Joan became really good friends while Joan was working for Peter. It appeared their friendship most likely crossed boundaries into being lovers. When the police went back to Betty and kind of told her what had happened, Betty then started admitting. She said that she had an abnormal relationship with Joan. Now this is code for they're having a sexual relationship. It was the 1950s, so you know, the word lesbian or homosexual was not even uttered back then. So when Betty moved in with Joan because of problems in the marriage, which I'm not sure what problems it was. I don't know if it was just Peter and Betty having problems or if the problems stemmed from Joan unknown. But anyway, because of the marriage problems, then Betty moved in with Joan for a while and they were free to kind of live out this domestic bliss with each other. But after a short time, like a couple weeks go by, Betty decided that she actually wanted to make her marriage with Peter work. So she did go back to Peter. She admitted to Peter that her and Joan had this affair. Now, Peter stated he'd forgive her, but on one condition, that they can move along and kind of restart this relationship again, but Betty could never ever see Joan again. So Betty agreed and they reconciled and then Joan was fired. Joan was upset and, and that Betty decided to go back to Peter and was left heartbroken. So what's a heartbroken gal to do? Take out her romantic rival. That's what. <laughs> Now, Joan knew that Goldine had a crush on her because Joan knew Goldine was kind of a more out, you know, with her sexuality. So she used Goldine and Goldine knew that, you know, Joan and Betty had once kind of had this love affair and she felt bad for Joan as well. So Joan seduced Goldine and convinced her to kill Peter by telling stories that Peter was this bad man and all this stuff. And even like told her that Peter abused their kids and Betty. And it was, you know, he was just overall just a really terrible person. I mean, that wasn't true. There was ever, no, no evidence of abuse or anything, but, uh, so that's how Joan Goldine and Peter all got in this big triangle. So police arrested Goldine and went and arrested Joan as well. Now, both women had to undergo evaluations by three different psychiatrists, all because uh, the court believed that because of their choice in sexual partners, you know, same-sex partners, that, you know, they could be unfit to stand trial. Really? So, Goldine stated that... The only motive really behind this crime was to please Joan and that she was easily influenced. Joan would plead not guilty right away and she never took the stand in her own defense or anything like that. Goldine would plead not guilty and claim insanity. So Joan actually thought she was home free because Goldine was the one that, you know, bought the gun. It was in Goldine's name. The locker was in Goldine's name where the gun was found. Goldine had already admitted that she was the one that pulled the trigger and shot Peter. So, you know, Joan figured it was all Goldine. I'm home free. However, the police weren't going to let Joan go that much, but they did understand that Joan could walk free because of the evidence. So a plea deal was put on the table for both women. Basically, they were reducing the first degree murder charge to a second degree murder charge. So both women did take the deal and they were sentenced to five years to life in prison. But both women were actually released after only a few years. I couldn't find how long they spent in prison, uh, but some sources say that it was at or less than five years. Like they did not spend over five years in prison at all. This case is cited frequently in some murder cases, um, kind of in, in debates showing that historically women were treated less harshly and got less sentencing 
than men that would have committed the same crime. So after Goldine got out of prison, she kind of just lived her life in the California area, never left, and she died in 1998 at the age of 83. Jones seemed to kind of disappear after she got out of prison. I could not find any record of her or where she ended up, um, which she could have gotten out of jail and just changed her name. Um, Betty sold the beauty shops right after Peter's death. Some sources state that she remarried and then other sources state that she never remarried. So I'm not quite sure there. Um, but Betty passed away in 1999 at the age of 81. There is some speculation that maybe Betty was involved in this whole murder plot with Peter, but there has never been any evidence to that fact. So what are your thoughts on this case? I'd love to hear what you think in the comments down below. If you'd like to become a feline friend, please hit that subscribe button. And if you'd like to become a feline fan, please hit that join button and become a member of this channel. For those of you that want an update on the kitten, Darth Kittyus, she is actually doing okay. We had a little trouble with her deciding not to eat but she is now eating. Um, she does still have a little bit of diarrhea and she pukes every now and then, but it is not as severe as it was. And she's now getting a little belly on her. So I'm confident that whatever this is, the vets can figure it out and we can get her 100% healthy. I would put her on camera. I don't wanna bug her cause she just ate. So I want her to settle. So thank you guys. We will be back here, come here. We will have our birthday boy, Black Phillip. <laughs> yeah. And our Halloween kitty. Say bye. And we'll be back next Friday with another true crime case or mystery. Bye, guys.